me. One second. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, I already uh, thanked you and uh, Mark already said that I'm a theoretician. So what I'm gonna do is tell you a bit uh, about prospects that we are exploring to how to take vibrational modes, couple them together spatially or temporally using parametric drives in order to either generate new sensing schemes or to come up with new uh, simulation platforms for interesting uh, emulation of material properties or for um, annealers. So this will be the when we're going to go to this uh, direction of Ising machines. So this will come towards the second part of my talk. So I'm a theoretician, but I work closely with again, experimentalists, especially with the group of Christian Degen and specifically Alexander Eichler. And I uh, benefit also from a close collaboration from another theoretician, I, Ramos of Omani and Chitra, uh, that I'm actually not sure she's going to be here today. Um, um, so generally, I want to tell you today about uh, three main things. We're going to start with spatial patterning of uh, vibrational modes. So for example, we will mainly focus about spatial patterning of silicon nitride two-dimensional membranes and uh, how we can take ideas from condensed matter from topological phases of matter in order to come up with new defect modes that would maybe be beneficial for our uh, sensing ideas or for emulation of the material properties themselves. Then we're going to start mixing in time dependent drives into the problem and we're going to see how we can do uh, mode locking or classical block oscillation effectively between normal modes of this uh, patterned system and by this get the notion of what we would like to call synthetic dimension or the possibility of emulating higher dimensional physics and then we're going to move deep into the nonlinear regime and we're going to see how these coupled modes when they are subject to degenerate parametric drives they undergo very interesting bifurcations that can then uh, perhaps be useful for uh, uh, solving optimization problems. So this is the recipe for today. And uh, I actually don't know how it works with the q and I see that there is already a comment. Ah, okay, no, it's not related to me. So I just assume that due to this format, I will take only questions at the end. So moving forward. Uh, so we start with the first part, spatial patterning, and we are considering now a two-dimensional membrane, and we're going to uh, care for its displacement. And specifically, in order to calculate its displacement, we need to know the thickness of this membrane, the Cauchy stress tensor, the density of the material, and by this, we have some sort of a wave equation of motion for, for the vibrations in the material. And then on top of it, we can also then pattern the material. And by patterning the material, what we're going to have is that we're breaking translation invariance for free vibrational modes moving in this uh, square drum. And because of this uh, uh, translation invariance breaking, it's a little bit uh, uh, opaque here. What we're going to have is additional splitting of our uh, dispersion relations into bands and bulk gaps of, of this material. So now what uh, people are actually doing the, with, with this type of patterning, it's called uh, phononic uh, engineering. And actually these pictures are taken by, uh, from this uh, work by the group of Albert Schlissel, is that you can actually now uh, use the bulk dispersion of this phononic metamaterial in order to al allow yourself to have these spectral gaps. And now by engineering the correct shape of, of a defect mode, you can actually place the defect mode deep within the spectral gap and by this actually disentangle it from its environment. And with this, uh, you now have vibrational modes that can reach quality factors of uh, uh, recently reported by the group of uh, Oscar Painter of five of 10 to the 10. Okay, so these modes are, are extremely coherent and, and very well separated from their environment. Now, uh, Already, just by the idea of having such such a platform and such high quality devices, we came uh, with with a notion of of thinking, hey, can we use it actually for sensing? And specifically, we went and explored uh, also together with Alexander Eichel and, uh, and Chitra and our student Tian Kosata and Christian Degen. Uh, we uh, 
explore the possibility of using such defect modes in order to have better uh, magnetic resonance force microscopy algorithms. And specifically what we uh, saw is that if you have then such uh, um, defect modes, you can actually use the flipping of the, of the spin that come from the magnetic resonance force microscopy algorithm as a parametric coupler between these two modes. And actually what you can, that idea then allows you to do is to actually place your sample on one place and read out the, the signal from another place. So the spatial separation already gives you a, a soft type of added value. And if you look at the parameters of how much you can optimize the silicon nitride devices, you can potentially actually take these devices with these soft added values to reach exactly at the same ballpark of what is uh, currently existing with state-of-the-art uh, uh, um, cantilever type uh, nano MRI devices. So this is uh, one idea, but uh, I'm a theoretician. So we want to now uh, go and bring additional toolboxes to these uh, membranes and see whether we can improve uh, also by coming up with new ideas for the spatial, spatial patterning of the material. So for this, we go and uh, look a little bit about uh, how at all do we get these bulk uh, bands in the system. And specifically, you can see that actually here in this, uh, in this illustration in the background, we have some sort of an underlying hexagonal structure to the system. And the internal structure can actually have different forms. As you can see here, there are like three different variants that we can think of. And uh, the overall metamaterial will then have some unit cell, hexagonal unit cell associated to it. And now this will give us all of our uh, uh, bands and additional gaps in the system. But uh, specifically what it also then gives us is some sort of symmetry to the overall uh, dispersion. And if we have this symmetry, we are then guaranteed uh, by the fact that it's a hexagon is what we, it guarantees to us is that we're gonna have some valid degrees of freedom where we're gonna have Dirac-like band touchings in the, exactly the same way that Shachar Ilani was uh, experiencing uh, um, Dirac cones in his uh, rolled up nanotubes. So having such Dirac uh, cones is something that when you're doing topological phases of matter, this is something that allows you to, to now add small perturbations that break these degeneracies in different ways that are then topologically distinct. And for this, we actually then need to consider, for example, two different uh, symmetry breaking perturbations. Here, for example, in the second row, we are breaking inversion symmetry, and that reduces the C6 uh, rotational symmetry to C3. Or we can break translation invariance and actually then uh, live in a larger unit cell, okay? So in both of these approaches, what actually happens is that we can consider the larger unit cell. This actually folds the valley Dirac cones from the hexagonal material into a new gamma point as we see over here. And now these symmetry breakings that we are talking about, you can think of them as some mass term that will take these dashed line Dirac cones that fall onto each other and gap them out to get you this gapped spectrum over here. So now actually we managed by knowing a little bit more about our structure and its symmetries to engineer exactly where we don't wanna have a gap. And also to understand a little bit that uh, here we kind of opened it up uh, trivially. So we see just standard P orbitals and D orbitals but in fact, if you then uh, know how to break the symmetry in opposite two different ways, you can actually then obtain uh, topologically distinct structures that look very similar to one another. But for example, here there is a band inversion. So here underlying is a P orbital and upstairs is a D orbital, but here it's inverted. Okay, so because of this bulk topological distinction between these two type of, of materials that share lots of similar feature with one another, what actually happens is that uh, there is a bulk boundary correspondence between these topological features. And at the interface between two such materials, you're gonna actually see uh, for a phononic guiding modes that are going to allow you to then uh, have the effect effective uh, topological transmission lines, but now for phononic excitations. 
So this is an experimental demonstration from the paper uh, by the Chinese group here. <clears throat> so now this is one, uh, one idea of what you can now use this for. So you can uh, place such a directional coupler or directional amplifier as was proposed by Florian Marquard and Vittorio Piano. Now to couple to distant uh, defect modes, for example. And what we can do as another step is actually to generalize these topological ideas to uh, a recently developed uh, notion of higher order topology. And in fact, we can combine these different symmetry breakings together in order to uh, come up with a zero dimensional interface mode that is then by topology, uh, um, promise to live exactly in the middle of the, ex of the gap that we opened up. And that makes it very much uh, robust to disorder and will have the most confined mode uh, 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 profile possible, which is very good for sensing applications. So uh, this is uh, um, some of, the, of existing work and work in progress. And we also want to realize it where we have then these ideas of coupling them together uh, um, these bulk boundary topological effects and putting them all together on our membrane in order to actually come up with some membrane city. So effectively, you could think of combining it and then bringing up isolators and uh, amplifier, directional amplifiers on the membrane uh, to have all phononic uh, sensors. So this is a little bit the higher goal of where we want to go about it. This is an image from SimCity that I took from the internet. Uh, and now this was just uh, applying uh, spatial patterning. And now let's see what happens when we're additionally adding some sort of time dependent drives. And specifically, let's uh, think about uh, mode coupling. And we, you are probably used to the idea that you will have uh, parametric coupling drives, but can we extend this idea beyond only two modes into having many of them? So uh, specifically, let's just you know think of our defect modes and now let's think of them as an, an effective potential well for vibration and excitation. And now we can also couple our uh, defects very weakly together but just by our spatial patterning. And effectively, if we're going to start to excite motion in one of our defect modes, the motion will start to then move to the neighbors, as, as we know. You know. And it will do that in a temporal way towards forming normal modes of the system. Now, technically, like again, like we've seen yesterday in Shachar Ilani's talk, each of these uh, wells can have additional free spectral range of orbital excitations that live at higher energies um, in this trapped defect. Or you could potentially, I mean, you can also think of trapping an atom and it will have some internal degree of freedom like a nuclear spin. Okay, and then you can use a parametric coupling drive or a, a Raman excitation drive uh, which will live at the difference between the two frequencies of this excited mode, which we denote here by color. And in a rotating picture now with respect to this drive, effectively what the excitation will have the ability to do is to either jump in space or get to decide to stay and get excited to, to another orbital state by uh, receiving energy from the drive. So the combination can actually uh, allow you to have a row of one dimensional defects that actually gives you the physics of, of effectively two dimensions because you will have additional motion uh, by intermode locking over time. So usually then you say, okay, so I have one D but it behaves effectively like two D. Can I actually realize it? Does it mean anything? And uh, actually in the past uh, three, three to four years, people actually realized it and they said, hey, we, were, we are looking for something that is truly two dimensional that we can see in this one dimensional chain of resonators. And what they did was to imprint an additional phase onto the uh, parametric coupling. And this phase is then growing in space. So if this is the X axis and this is the synthetic dimension, here we will have phase one, here you will have phase two, and here you will have phase three. Now, what that actually implies is that if an excitation goes around such a square 
synthetic plaquette, it will collect the geometrical phase and it will behave effectively as if uh, it would have been a charged particle moving in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field. So in fact, you're realizing in 1D a two-dimensional synthetic system with a, which maps to the integer quantum Hall effect. And here too, because it's a topologically non-trivial system, you will start to have edge modes at the interface to the boundary, to the vacuum. But now the funny in, uh, edge modes that live here, they live in the 2D synthetic plane. So they're actually going to uh, move in a chiral way. So in, in, if you're at the bottom frequency, you will move to the right. If you're at this edge, you will get up converted. And if you're uh, moving to some top frequency, allowed frequency over here, you will again move to the left and here get down converted. And this is actually something that was realized using both uh, cold atoms in these works over here and in or coupling orbital modes of uh, photonic crystals in this nature paper from two years ago. So uh, this is a, a, a nice idea. Can it actually also be useful? So uh, for example, we proposed how to uh, realize edge modes by using the Zeno effect. So for example, you can couple a specific frequency to a bath that is very dissipative at that frequency. And this will define to you an edge mode in your free spectral range. And you can then use it as an isolator. So for example, what you see over here is uh, the idea of exciting an edge mode that is moving counterclockwise at this green frequency. And therefore, it will move to the left. But if you would excite from the left-hand side, it would only get down converted. And then if you compare exactly the same systems, which will be the blue and the red line, so you can see that actually excitations do move quite a lot as a function of the length of, of the uh, system to the, from right to left but are very much quenched when you want to see the motion from left to right. Okay, so this is another idea of what you can then have in your membrane city as, as a non-reciprocal uh, transport mechanism. So uh, just for, for those that like to dream even uh, further, you can then think of coupling three-dimensional uh, uh, array of defects together and additionally induce parametric coupling between the internal modes. And then we have a proposal on how to actually realize in the lab the four-dimensional quantum Hall effect. So this is some sort of a mathematical curiosity that, that we don't have a good intuition from our three-dimensional world for, but it's actually a model that is very interesting for, for uh, uh, the field of topology. Okay, so with this, I would like to still see my time. How am I on time? You still have time. I still have time. Okay, yeah, you, very you, good. You have, you have 11 minutes. Very good. Okay, good. So this was kind of uh, uh, living all within the linear domain, and we saw a little bit how you can think of uh, patterning uh, modes in space, uh, getting normal modes due to their coupling together, using parametric coupling drives to even think of a notion of synthetic dimension. And now we want to move deep into the nonlinear domain. So we want to start to apply uh, degenerate parametric drive and see how these drives interplay with nonlinearities to give us bifurcations and, and maybe new effects that are interesting. Now, two years ago, uh, Alex Eichel presented some of our uh, earlier results on how to use such ideas for sensing. So this I'm going to uh, skip today. And more additionally, I actually benefit from the fact that Michael Rukas yesterday gave a, a very nice introduction to the how far uh, this field actually goes. So we, you can see that we also uh, think that it's quite a rich field that many people contributed to. Uh, over the years, uh, and specifically, I just want to, to harness what I, I need for my presentation today, but I will still make one pedagogical reminder that for parametric resonances, we should all have a very good intuitive feeling about it, namely because this is what we do when we are driving a swing uh, with our body, 
So effectively, uh, what we are doing is that we're changing the center of mass of our swing over uh, a round trip, and we are changing it twice, right? Because we do it once on the on going forward and once on going back. And I think that actually, Mark, when you visited me here at ETH, I think that you demonstrated it uh, much better in person <laughs> than what I do here on, on screen. OK, uh, specifically, uh, so this motion can be understood as changing the eigenfrequency of a bare resonator over time. And what it leads to, and this was also discussed yesterday, is to this Arnold Tang uh, stability diagram, where due to this uh, parametric driving, the um, linear oscillator will have regions where it's stable to this drive and doesn't feel it at all, or regions where the linear oscillator is susceptible to the drive and wants to, um, to explode. It wants to become unstable. Um, dissipation, unlike standard external driving of a resonator, dissipation cannot always win against this drive and, and uh, uh, stabilize the resonator, but it can push a little bit the instability uh, lines as seen over here. And uh, actually this combination of parametric drive and knowing that, that our universe doesn't explode all the time uh, leads to the fact that, that many people actually employ such drives to uh, obtain squeezing in this linear uh, stabilized regime due to the interplay between dissipation and uh, the parametric drive. So actually in, the, in this green region, you get uh, parametric amplification for many sensing applications. Actually with Guillermo uh, Villanueva, we also revisited a little bit uh, the SNR considerations that you will want to have in this domain. Now, uh, the focus of today is what happens when you go into this region. This region is where you would expect the linear oscillator to explode, but actually then uh, nonlinearities come to the rescue. And specifically, so let's consider having an additional cubic nonlinearity. And um, I apologize for the text here overlapping with the equation. And I mean, for the time being, we actually don't care about such nonlinear dissipation terms. So at the uh, competition between the uh, parametric drive and the nonlinearity, what actually happens is that the closed system develops a, a period doubling bifurcation. It actually starts to have two high amplitude solutions that are relevant for the system. And the system then uh, spontaneously decides to fall into one minima or the other. And here is an, an image of what happens when you wait for a long time for, for also seeing what happens when there is going to be excitations between these two minima. Um, for people that may have heard recently the words uh, time crystal, so uh, for classical uh, uh, people that are used to period doubling bifurcations, maybe time crystals may not seem as something overly exciting. But effectively, just to tell you that this is uh, very much related to what we are seeing over here, namely the closed system is subject to par degenerate parametric driving. So it means that the only time dependence in our Hamiltonian is at double the frequency of where you see the response of the system. So the system is actually responding, responding with a subharmonic response to the degenerate parametric drive. Um, so this is the, uh, a little bit just the catching up on what we should know about it. And now let's try to explore applications and uh, we leave sensing aside and focus on uh, using this bimodality of the system for phase logic, okay? So we saw the bifurcation occurs in phase space. We have actually two uh, steady state solutions characterized by the same amplitude, but opposite uh, by pi in phase. And actually you can then say, okay, if I have this bimodality, I can encode a bit in it. And this is an, an idea that already existed for a while. And in fact, the first Japanese computers uh, were built exactly using this uh, phase logic, um, uh, using then a realization of RLC um, uh, coupled RLC circuits. And now with nanomechanical resonators and with improvement of uh, 
of, of the quality factor of such devices, there is actually uh, since uh, about uh, 13 years, uh, revived interest in the idea of whether one can actually build up phase logic again in the phase of, a, of such a parametron. So actually this bifurcated parametric resonator and its bimodality is going under the name of a parametron. So, uh, you know, it's actually, if you think about it, it's quite hard to imagine that we could go and win against uh, silicon transistor uh, technology that is so optimized uh, to give us nowadays computers that also then allow us to go on having conferences in Corona times. Uh, and for this, we have to then think for a second on what used to be the problems of, of this encoding of, of bits for quantum, in, for not quantum, for information processing. So uh, what we know is that it behaves like a resonator. So in order for it to undergo the symmetry breaking translation and decide that it's in bit one or bit zero, we have to wait for, for ring down times of the system. And effectively what additionally happens is that if you wanna flip from one to the other, you have to switch off drive, you have to switch them on again and put the, the excitation from one side to the other. So it could potentially be very slow. Um, and actually, we also then looked at uh, how to explore various uh, bifurcation topologies in order to perhaps make it faster, but we were always still limited by the ring down time until uh, two years ago, because we're already in 21, we came up with the idea that in fact, we can do something very similar to what people uh, do in uh, quantum gating. We can make a pulsed modulation and because the system is actually time dependent and rotating, like we saw before in the animation, you can in fact hold the system for half a cycle. And by this, you have already flipped the spin. So for example, what you can see over here is an experiment that uh, uh, Alex Eichler did on, a, on an electrical circuit and also uh, in the group of Lucas Novotny with uh, Martin Frimer, it was done on a levitating particle that you can actually see the oscillation in one of the phase states. And then uh, a pulse is enacted, holds the potential in space for half a cycle, and then you're moving at the opposite phase of the oscillation. So this can be a sub cycle uh, bit flip for such applications. Uh, but uh, again, it's probably really hard to think of competing with uh, silicon transistor technologies with, this, uh, with these ideas. Uh, and in, in fact, there is something more to this system because it's actually an oscillating system with its bifurcations. And we know a lot about how to couple these and make networks out of them as we saw in the first part of my talk. So in fact, instead of just in trying to encode a bit and keep it there forever, how about we just try to then couple these bifurcated systems together into a network and have the opportunity of exploring two to the N uh, possible attractors of the system in order to use it as, a, as an analog on-chip uh, annealer or as a tunable neural network, okay? So instead of thinking of it as a bit, we would like to think of it now as an Ising spin. Um, so, so this is actually quite a promising idea and there are many people that already proposed that this idea can be used for optimization problems and solving uh, NP hard problems. Um, and the idea is technically very much similar to what we are doing when we are annealing a metal. So uh, in equilibrium statistical physics, we are heating up the system and cool cooling it down again. And by this, the excitation can actually explore uh, phase space and look for zero. Okay, uh, so one minute, I'll try to finish, okay? Uh, and explore uh, the bottom of the energy potential. Here we actually have rotating states that are completely out of equilibrium and are driven. So we don't have a notion of, of a ground state, but we still have a notion of in inducing stochastic resonances between, between different attractors of the system. And this is in fact what we set out to explore. Uh, I will just, it's actually a shame I was talking too slowly. Uh, effectively what we set out to explore is coupling then many of these modes together to have the potential of having two to the N, but before you go to N, you start with two. 
<laughs> and specifically, you can think of starting with n uh, degenerate modes, coupling them together, obtaining many normal modes, and each of these normal modes will have their own stability, Arnold tongue globe. And technically, you would assume that when they all overlap, this is where you should find your, your holy grail of where all of these should uh, coexist and allow you to have these annealers. Um, so the story is actually much more complicated. When you couple, you should not couple too strongly because then the lobes don't overlap. So this is uh, one thing that we found out. And then you just get normal modes. And these normal modes effectively just get a single parameter onto your system. You can weak, weakly couple them. But then there is a huge mess of attractors going on here. And the fact that the nonlinearity bends in a specific direction is very complex and needs to be then understood. And this specific realization was done uh, with Alex with hanging half a meter long guitar strings. So if we wanted to also explore uh, slow switching dynamics in the system, we had to speed up. And this is then work that is we're about to put out that, uh, that we then move to electrical circuits that now operate in the megahertz. And then what happens is that if you now zoom in, Mark, I'm finishing. The, uh, it turns out that the system is completely uh, much richer than what we have thought before, especially because the bending of the nonlinearity now interplays with generating new attractors of the system and quenches them. And in fact, the, the reason I gave a title to my talk, Ghost in the Ising Machine, is because here we assumed that there should be both parametrons from the symmetric mode and the anti-symmetric mode. But in fact, what we find is that here, the anti-symmetric mode parametrons are in fact not stable, OK? So they are not stable. So you would assume that actually you cannot do your, your annealing in this regime. And you have to look even better and find the regimes where it would be possible. Uh, but uh, then we still went and explored what will happen with the switching dynamics over here. And then here, I just want to tell you that these ghosts still appear in the switching dynamics. Um, so you can do a weak noise, pump noisy probe uh, spectroscopy of the system. I will skip this. Uh, or you can also find out when you have switching rates between attractors. And when you quantify it together, you can actually see that in this region, even though you have ghosts in the Ising machine, you start to see the, the excitation rate between parameters in the system is already affected by the fact that you have this metastable attractors there. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, so to say. And uh, of course, this fits very well with Mark's predictions. But here it's where it gets more complicated, Mark. <laughs> OK. Um, and all of this can go to the quantum domain, where you do then uh, exactly the same resonators and do cat qubits coupled together. And this is something that is now becoming uh, uh, a viable new idea for bosonic uh, codes using uh, superconducting qubits. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I apologize for taking uh, two more uh, minutes of your time. And I would like to also thank all of my collaborators on the topic. Also go and okay. put the light on. I order, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Very interesting. Uh, let me start a uh, discussion uh, with something that you mentioned before. There are many questions that your talk actually inspires, uh, how to say this. Uh, but one of the questions which is pretty straightforward, what is the role of appearance in this uh, 2D uh, synthetic uh, uh, plane, because when you are talking about a quantum Hall effect, it's a coherent effect. When you have decoherence and you have many nodes, so essentially there are two things that play with each other. The size of the crystal, which has to be sufficiently large, and I don't know what the word sufficiently means, and the decoherence, which is always there, and these two factors interplay. So what can you comment? On yeah, so, so I mean, this is something that uh, um, people already thought about uh, making uh, 
the whole effect with resonators, but already just in space. And therefore, this already, this type of question already is, is valid to query what do people expect in real space. And then there is always the complexity of, of synthetic space. So let me, uh, I, I'm going to try to skim really fast up to this 2D lattice that we had, just that we have it in front of our face. Uh, so effectively, there is something important uh, to notice about uh, the difference in driven bosonic uh, realizations of the Hall effect and electronic realizations of the Hall effect. So in electrons, they, you, you will have a similar structure and the electrons are going to obey Pauli, Pauli's exclusion principle and will have effective chemical potential. So, so they have, uh, they, they already populate it and fill the whole effect by the fact that they are there, right? So we have to, uh, um, in order to make the comparison, we have to divide the procedure into two. The, the first thing is that we have a structure that is geometrically frustrated. Okay, the, the, this is uh, in the Hall effect, usually the magnetic field is frustrating the translation of free electrons. Okay, and that leads you to Landau levels. So the, the spectrum, regardless of whether it's going to be populated by fermions or bosons is going to be topological. And the topology guarantees to you to have the bulk boundary correspondences, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can decide that you want to fill this spectrum with fermions, and then you will get what you are used to seeing from the quantum Hall effect, such that actually you can put a bias and you will have the, the chiral, edge, uh, chiral transport from the edges and, and, and things like this. Or you could decide that you're just driving the system and you can drive the system at the normal mo mode eigenfrequencies uh, that maybe correspond to an edge mode, a topological edge mode. Okay, so this, this is one anecdote of what people have done mostly in the past decade with topological driven systems. They mostly realized an empty shell waiting for electrons and then excited uh, topological edge modes to, to spectroscopize the system. Okay, so that, that's the first anecdote. The second anecdote is that if you do want to now move and, and maybe make an interplay between your drives and your dissipation, you can actually come up with, with schemes where the dissipation maybe even helps you. You can drive the whole bulk band and use dissipation to have an effective homogeneous feeling of, of the modes of your band just because the, the dissipation broadening is already wider than the bandwidth of your system. And, and then you can reach steady states that look very similar to what the electrons would, would have done had they wanted to fill that band. I hope that this answered your, your question. And of course, when you take it to, the, to the, this more Floquet-like rotating picture, then similar questions come up and then you need to fill these bands. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, then there is a question from Ata Kaske clark uh, thanks for the nice talk. In the model shown, uh, the parametric resonance is bounded by nonlinear damping term C times X uh, dx uh, squared. How much control do you have on it experimentally? Um, so I want to just verify, do we talk about alpha? Uh, I think about eta. So eta is nonlinear damping and the nonlinear damping actually doesn't play a, a huge role in our system. It actually acts mostly to, to chop, off, um, uh, chop off these, uh, these uh, parameter online. So if you don't have nonlinear damping, you will expect to see a high amplitude solution going to infinity. So this is what the nonlinear damping does. Uh, we don't control it, but we can uh, estimate it by the fact that we see where these lines are being chopped off. Uh, alpha, we do also do not control, uh, but we can again extract it by the line shapes of the high amplitude solution. So using such hysteretic responses. So I hope that this answers the question. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, a uh, question from Hiroshi. Uh, Okay, can you hear me? It's yes. okay? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So uh, in the final part, you mentioned about the, the Ising machine, yeah? So if you want to implement the uh, uh, optimization program for the, this uh, network, you need to uh, assign the coupling uh, for the given uh, problem. So you need, I mean that you need to adjust the coupling. Right. Among the uh, different Ising, so let me confirm that how you 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 assign that the uh, that the coupling in your model. So, so the couple, so I didn't actually write the model for the two. So this is uh, at the moment we are just assuming linear coupling between huh? them. Um, in the these two realizations, the, again, this was uh, a tabletop experiment that costed uh, 300 bucks because mm -hmm. this is a half a meter long guitar string. And in order to make strong coupling, we just glued another guitar string onto it. So, uh -huh. so this was a very r rudimentary just to show that the proof of concept, so to say. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, here, the weak coupling is just mediating. So the parametric coupling is enacted onto both strings by a vibrating wall over here that actually mediates then still weak coupling between the two half meter long guitar strings. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the, you cannot go far with such a realization. So Alex now has in his lab already uh, custom made uh, nano mechanical or micro mechanical resonators that he's trying to now couple together. And then of course, th there's all of the challenges of doing exactly that. So mm -hmm. your question is, is highly important, right? <laughs> you want to do that uh, in a tunable, reasonable way that doesn't uh, make it that you have to wait for days, right? Because I want to even highlight here, we had okay. a resonance frequency of 160 Hertz. We heard it. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, and here in the electrical devices, you actually have a capacitive coupling. So here you can, you can by hand exchange the capacitor technically, or use a voltage tunable capacitor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. You, there are no more talks and. Uh, let's uh, thank Odad again for the wonderful talk. And with this, we switch to the poster session.